Um, I, so I serve as the lead minister at First View. I came just as a solo minister um, in the fall of 2016. Mm -hmm. So I'm in my fifth year there now. Um, and, um, and President Trump was elected a couple of months after I um, arrived. Right. And so we had, um, we had this experience, uh, at the, as I think many congregations did, of um, not only they were going through a ministerial transition during the time, but um, but experiencing this really um, uh, shocking for many of us uh, national um, national event, and people becoming really clear that um, that being good people alone or doing social justice work alone. Um, wasn't enough and wasn't going to cut it um, in this particular time of of the country, and so it's been um, we've been growing a lot um, and trying to find ways to to bridge bridge the gap between this this very old congregation, this 224 year old congregation, mm -hmm. and and about half of our congregants are new, sort of in that time that I've been here. So we have a lot of young adults, a lot of um, a lot of empty nesters who moved often from suburbs down into the center of the city so that they could live on sort of single floor living and in a walkable neighborhood and age in place. Um, and then kind of everything, everything in between. Um, so that's kind of like who we are right now. We, um, we have a strong commitment to social justice as a congregation. Um, our first, settled minister who is William Henry Furness in, I don't know, he came in 1815, I think, mm. 1820, no, he came in 1825. Um, he was known as this fiery abolitionist, like faced assassination threats because of um, preaching abolitionist sermons at a time when that was not, um, that was not an acceptable thing to do. Right. And, um, and the congregation also had people who made made money off of the slave trade um, at the time, and so it was a um, making a strong commitment towards racial justice was like at the very very central at the earliest part of our history, mm -hmm. um, and that's a commitment that we continue to make and continue to carry forward. Um, well, and which is part of part of why part of why I. I'm involved with justice work in the way that I am. Yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, I invited you to, to, to join us to talk a little bit about your experiences specifically at um, the demonstrations that have happened this year in the city of Philadelphia, which have been um, ongoing pretty much since um, the middle of the summer. Um, but mm -hmm. I also know that in addition to you personally, that, that first you, Philly, um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you have congregants that are out there with you often when you're out marching and when you're showing up for these demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was probably happening before you were their minister. Yeah. To some extent, that kind of involvement. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, obviously COVID has made it a lot harder because people have to, you know, um, make decisions about their risk level. Right. So um, it's more, I would say that the the people that I have seen out in kind of protests has lent, leaned more towards the young adult side of our congregation than before when it would have kind of been everyone. But, um, but actually a lot of my elders are sort of coming out and like holding a sign and having a mask at the, you know, at the very edge of protests, not maybe not participating in marches, but, um, but being, um, being present, being part of the movement yeah. in, in the ways that they can be right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, you served one other congregation before this, is that right, in Oakland, California? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I served the First Unitarian Church of Oakland um, just, just for a year mm -hmm. um, as a um, kind of contract minister for worship and pastoral care. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your own experience, I guess, with demonstrations and protests prior to the events of this year? Is that something that, you know, are you one of those... Um, people who has stories about being taken to protest as a baby? Are you somebody who came to this later in life? Like no. how, <laughs> no, your mom no. didn't, didn't have you in a carrier at a protest? 
No, she did not. Um, <laughs> my parents are, are were very dedicated to to living uh, lives that make the world a better place, but not in that way. <laughs> um, my uh, well, for for a lot of people, it's that I first wasn't... step, I think, of attending a protest for the first time is kind of a big one. You know, how how did that come about in your life? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually remember what my first protest was, um, but. You know, honestly, I'm an I'm kind of an institutionalist, mm -hmm. and um, and from from my I grew up Unitarian Universalist, and in my teens, I began to get involved with racial justice work and began to really understand what what that meant and what it meant to be a white person in America, and um, and therefore like what my commitment needed to be to try to dismantle racism that the racism that privileged me and oppressed others. And most of the ways that I engaged with that was like through institutions, was like working on committees, like being in leadership roles and trying to do institutional change. Mm -hmm. And my first career was doing climate change policy. So I worked for the government, um, but didn't, wasn't like on the streets. That wasn't sort of part of my, or, or it hasn't always been part of my um, way of, of trying to transform the world. Right. Um, you were in the halls of I power. I became more <laughs> <laughs> trying to be. Yeah. That, that didn't work out so well for me. <laughs> but um, it, it ended up like not being that particular, the particular group of trade-offs you have to make when you work in a policy role um, ended up not being the right fit for me. And so um, I went into ministry and realized that like when you wear a clergy collar out at a protest, um, there's a very particular role that you are playing. Like it, it's important to mass movements are important um, in general and pe just people being part of that is an important way that we transform the world for, for the better. Um, but I realized like once I was in seminary that wearing a clergy collar meant um, um, people, I think people tend to see it as um, not just bringing because sometimes protests are like a lot about anger um or a lot about rage and um and i think when there's clergy there it i think it helps people see that it's it's about something more than just kind of a mob mentality it's about um it's about like a deep rooted grounded moral commitment to making the world a better place mm -hmm. um so there's there's a sort of way that showing up in witness visibly as a clergy person can help um, can help tell the story of the movement in a in a way that's helpful. Um, and almost remind and, people people there maybe and also people watching what kind of the morals like pull people back towards the moral center of why we're here, which can be probably yeah. um, well I know from watching the news and I know from my own experience of protests, it, there are lots of distractions often from that moral message because any gathering of mass people, um, especially with lots of emotions running high, so much is happening. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think, you know, when you're particularly talking about racial justice protests or Black Lives Matter protests, um, being, being a white person who is identified as a, a clergy person, also being a woman, um, that those identities can help, I think can help deescalate police um, agitation or police violence. Um, and um, and it, one of the roles that feels really important to me when possible is to like put my body between police and black and brown protesters who are much more likely to be recipients of police violence mm -hmm. um, in these settings. Um, which you know sometimes sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. I'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this summer in more detail. But yeah. um, sometimes sometimes that makes a difference, and sometimes you get tear gassed anyway. Um, so you had experiences those, of doing those that. Are some roles that I particularly feel are important. Yeah, you yeah. had experiences of doing that this summer with with uh, and and to be clear, I should say when you when you're out at the demonstrations this year, it seems like you were mostly with a group of clergy. Is that right? But but that that opportunity came up mm -hmm. frequently to, to literally put your bodies in between protesters, people of color on the streets and police officers? 
Yeah. Um, so this, this summer, a group of people, a group of clergy and faith leaders began to organize ourselves. We, we've, we haven't really landed on a perfect name, but we've been basically kind of calling ourselves movement chaplain. Mm -hmm. um, so basically faith leaders and clergy of, of a variety of traditions who, um, who are in, we have a, a communication network and, um, and when we hear of something happening or when there's a call for a clergy presence to show up to try to help de-escalate or, or whatever, um, we're the ones who respond. And, um, and we have a pretty good rhythm. We're mostly committed to having at least a buddy system. <laughs> so ideally there's at least two of us out at once. Um, and that kind of shifts over time, but we, um, we try to figure out ways to, to be, um, not out there by ourselves, but, but sometimes that means we spread through the crowd. Sometimes that means that people, you know, we're in communication someone says, okay, we need some people up at the front of the line. We need some people at the back of the line, or there's an, there's police who are harassing protesters over here. And so some, some of us go over there. Um, but yeah, mostly organizing with other clergy and then in relationship with street medics and with legal observers and with, um, protest organizers as well, um, to try to, use um, use our identities as clergy and our skills as clergy um, to be of use to the to the movement itself yeah. Um, so yeah I mean there's definitely times when when that means like okay white people to the front um, or like um, on yeah that, there's there's particular times when it makes sense for me to be there and there's particular times when it's like this is this is an action where we're inviting people of color only um, and so we, sometimes we help play a role. We, by I mean, I mean white clergy, um, can help play a role in um, supporting communication networks that are ha that are happening for people who are out on the streets. Um, there's other sort of background roles that we can still play, even when it doesn't make sense for us to be the people at the front. Yeah. So one of the things I think also it took me a while to wrap my mind around. Um, is the difference between different kinds of protests and demonstrations. Um, I know I, I lived in Washington, D.C. right after college. I was there for five years, you know that. Um, and um, that I think, I, I think I did, when I was in college, I think I went on a bus at some point to some march in D.C. and I don't remember which one it was, sadly now. Um, but I remember when I lived in D.C., um, I went to the, the March for Women's Lives. I went to a whole bunch of anti-war marches. This was during George W. Bush's administration. Um, mm -hmm. And I only had that experience of protest and that experience of protest was very much like, it's a large event. There are buses, right? There are, there's time where people have planned and there's people traveling from other places. Um, this is also the kind of protest that at Wellsprings, our congregation has typically been a part of. So we sent a bus of people, um, we've, we've, we've had members of our congregation go to the, the women's marches in previous years. There was a March for Science in DC that we sent people to. There's a March for Racial Justice in DC that we got a bus for. Um, and those kinds of marches have a stage at the front. They have AV, right? They have, <laughs> they have a microphone. Um, they have a program. Right. They um, are a different kind of experience than what you're talking about having done this summer. Um, and then I think there's a whole other level even of kind of organized direct action, which is more like, okay, a group of people have made a plan to lay down in a pipeline or a group of people have made a plan to right. block a particular highway at a particular time for a purpose. Um, and it took me a long time to, I don't, I don't actually quite know the right terminology to talk about it. I know that a direct action is more like, you know, we're going to lay down in a pipeline. We're going to chain ourselves to a tree is kind of like the old fashioned way maybe of thinking about it, right? Like, so it doesn't get cut down. That's, that to me is direct action, I yeah. think, right? That's the right term. How would you describe the difference between the other, the first two kinds of protests or demonstrations that I talked about? And, and does that, does what I described kind of ring true for you that there is a difference there? You know, there's permits at one and there's not at the other, that kind of thing. <laughs> there's porta potties. There's porta potties. Yeah, that's probably yeah. a key difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and honestly, there's there's been all 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 sorts over the summer and and into the fall, and um, and sometimes once it starts as one and then kind of morphs, or there's a group that breaks off and does something else. Um, particularly right now, I mean, the way that the the way that justice movements are happening right now is 
not that there is like one one leader or one organization. There's lots of different organizations with um, with different um, different needs and hopes and demands and um, and ideally we're working together in coalition um, towards the same goal, but it, it varies and there's definitely conflict within those groups about what the right path is and um, and and when you're doing rapid response work as well. So like when Walter Wallace Jr. was murdered, um, a bunch of groups sort of got out on the streets to do the whatever the thing was that felt the right thing for them to do. Um, and sometimes they were like nearby each other, but not doing the same thing. And, and then they would merge. So it, it's, it's all very fluid and, and um, uh, hard. It, it's hard to pin down. Um, and hard to hard to figure out how to navigate even often. Um, our congregation also sort of organizes most effectively for those kind of big march things where you have notice, you can rent a bus or you can put out an email to say, let's meet at this place and walk towards City Hall together or whatever. Um, that That is definitely the easier way to organize a group of people like a congregation. Um, what's been happening um, over the summer and and it's been part of the I would say that the first kind of protest that I really became involved with as on a regular basis was when the Black Lives Matter movement was beginning in the Bay Area um, and I was in seminary and then was working for my seminary and then was serving as uh, one of the ministers of the Oakland congregation um, that that was um, much more loosely organized and it was like, okay, we're going to start here and then we're going to move. And, and the organizers are figuring it out as they go. Um, the police are figuring it out as they go. The police are sometimes just kind of monitoring and sometimes they're actively trying to trap a big group of protesters and arrest them. Um, and then there's some people who are breaking off who want to light things on fire. And then there's mo the, you know, 99% of everybody else wants to chant and call for justice, you know, in a public way and witness with their, with their presence for justice. Um, so, and this summer has been, has been even, <laughs> even more complicated than that. Um, I mean, I, and I, it's taken different shape in, um, different places around the country but with um, with George Floyd's murder there was a, a outpouring of um, of fury and um, grief and um, in Philadelphia there was I think there was a I'm trying to remember how it began I think there was a specifically planned march that happened on a Saturday and um, later that night that people kind of didn't, after the march, people didn't go home and there ended up being some property destruction around, um, center city. And we can't, and the, that was the first night that we had a curfew in Philadelphia. And so clergy were called to the clergy that I organized with were called down to the city to provide hopefully a stabilizing presence. That was, that was our goal the night when the curfew happened because we weren't sure how the police were going to respond to the curfew and how they were going how forceful they were going to be with any civilians who were who were downtown um and that night we saw police who were mostly on bikes basically like protecting like the walgreens right at broad and walnut downtown um and um and we didn't see the police interacting with, with the, the people too much. Um, and I don't think that there was violence from the police that, that night that I know of. Um, there were a handful of people who were arrested, but um, not, a huge, not a huge presence. Um, and then the next day in West Philadelphia, where I live, um, we had church in the morning and then I like served on an interfaith panel, all like virtually from my living room. And, and then we heard that something was happening at 52nd street, which is two blocks from where I live. Um, a residential neighborhood. Like a ma yeah. Major, 
it's a, yeah, it's it's a it's sort of a business small business corridor in the middle of a big residential mm -hmm. neighborhood, and um, and in talking with my black clergy colleagues whose leadership I follow, you know, I was like, Do, would it be useful to have some white clergy out there? And they were like, yes, it would be it would be good to know what's going on and to have some clergy who are there. And so I walked up to two blocks from my house um, and put out the call to the other clergy who I know who live within walking distance of me. And, um, and, and like within 10 minutes was, was tear gas without kind of um, any notice from the police along with my whole neighborhood. And then, and we're just, they were just, there was like a tank in the middle of my neighborhood volleying tear gas canisters in all directions um, past people who were having birthday parties on their porch um, past kids and people in wheelchairs who couldn't get away from the tear gas quickly um, you know elders with canes and just you know and it some of the tear gas canisters landed on people's porches and like children had to run screaming out of their own homes um, that wasn't that wasn't even a protest. I mean, that was just that was just police. I think that there had been maybe a little bit of property destruction on 52nd Street. We're still not really clear how it started, mm -hmm. um, but but basically there was a massive police presence, including a very militarized police presence that descended on a residential neighborhood. My neighborhood is mostly black, and just volleyed tear gas and rubber bullets at us for hours, for maybe five hours. Um, and that, that, was, that was unlike anything I had experienced beforehand um, and was very different because it wasn't like, it wasn't like a response. It like, and then the next day on 676 on the highway, um, there was a massive kind of tear gassing of, of protesters. But even that, it was, it was targeted at the people who were um, who were choosing to protest. Mm -hmm. There was there was other people who got kind of caught up in it, but... Um, there were people out marching organized and the response was targeted towards the people who were marching as opposed yeah. to in your neighborhood. And it, it, that was a... Right. Yeah. And that, it was a really incredibly, if you haven't looked at, <laughs> if anyone who sees this hasn't looked at what happened that day, like you should watch some videos because it was egregious and awful and horrible. Um, but um, but what happened in my neighborhood was very different. It was like it was like living in a war zone, um, like under. It, it was just it was nuts, mm -hmm. and it's something that would not have happened. I feel very clear would not have happened in a white neighborhood, like anywhere, mm -hmm. um, never in any of the largely white neighborhoods that I've lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a completely different story. I mean, I showed up in my clergy collar, but the police were shooting tear gas, you know, from a block away. They never. Took them took a moment to see, and we were all bystanders for the most part who were there. They never, you know, tried to figure out um, who they were tear gassing. It was obviously a neighborhood, um, a residential neighborhood, um, but didn't take, didn't give us any warning, and then didn't um, try to communicate with anyone around them at all. Just just tried to keep us um, at a distance by shooting things at us, mm -hmm. basically. Um, it was terrifying. I'm so sorry that you experienced that and, and that your neighborhood experienced that. Um, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think that, yeah, I, go ahead. I, I it was, I mean, I chose to be there and to show up at, in my role as a clergy person. Like that was not, that was not the choice that many people made. No one should, no one should experience that in their neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and, and particularly targeting like a poor black community is that's, that's what was the problem with it more than my own experience of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I have my own thoughts, but I'm curious to hear from you. What do you think the aim of that response was by the police? Like, what were they trying to do? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm actually serving right now on um, on a commission that the comptroller for the city of Philadelphia um, has pulled together. That that's like a group of um, business leaders, sort of residential 
like residential association leaders and activists, Black Lives Matter movement activists, um, to investigate that because it it was it was t it made no sense to me. Um, I mean, obviously the um, maybe it's not obvious. Uh, what it feels, what feels obvious to me is that often police view their job as protecting property, not lives. And, um, and so I think that that was part of the, um, I would assume that that was part of the justification, but the, the magnitude of their response was just out of, out of control. Um, so part of what we're trying to do as a commission is, um, is investigate what, like what happened, um, with the goal of it never happening again. And from the controller's perspective, you know, she's using her office um, to ensure that city resources are used for the benefit of the people, which obviously is not what happened that day. Right. Um, and in many of those days. Um, so that's, that's part of what feels so nuts. Cause like it was that same day. I don't know if you remember this, that like, white vigilantes were like roaming fish town with shovels yep. and baseball bats and stuff like trying to like help the police and protect the police yep. um and who were like high-fived and helped out by the police yeah. and we were so like a group of armed people intentionally intent on violence um were wandering around a largely white neighborhood and were supported by the police whereas a bunch of unarmed civilians including elders children people with disabilities um, were just being, um, being attacked by the police that day. Yeah. So like, to me, that's just racism. Like, I, I don't know how you can characterize it really as anything other than that. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, I, I lift that up or bring that question up, I guess, just because again, I think, um, for people who have the kind of experience with protest that I had in my twenties of, you know, the police are closing the streets for the protest. You know, the, the permits mm -hmm. are in place. The, um, sure. you know, they're, they're waving as people pass by, you know, they're, they are in there, they're standing outside their cop cars walking off traffic. Um, it's such a different mm -hmm. experience, you know, and if people look back to their own experiences of going to protests like that, they think the police were there to help. They, they were friendly, they were supportive, they were, yeah. um, Right. And and that is a distinction, I think, that gets lost sometimes in social justice movements when things get a little hairy or when things get dangerous or dicey and when people are really putting their bodies on a line in, in a different way, putting their bodies on the line in a different way. Um, the, the eruption of grief and frustration and anger and demands for justice that came after George Floyd was murdered were spontaneous and the people were shutting down the streets by being there, not because the streets were shut down before they got there. Um, and mm -hmm. that kind of a mass gathering, I think is even more powerful because it's not being done with the, with the approval, you know, pr prior approval kind of, of, mm -hmm. of the state. It's pushing back against those forces and saying, you know, you're not protecting us adequately. We need you to pay attention to this. Um, and, the dynamics we saw this summer broke my heart because the the they they highlight exactly why people are out there in the streets in the first place like you said you know the idea that protecting mm -hmm. this idea that's somewhat abstract or that's certainly unequally applied of law and order is more important than protecting and honoring why people are out there in the, in the first place um so i you know i think back to that summer to the summer and i think about why police might have gone into your neighborhood and tear gassed a residential neighborhood and families and and kids out on the streets and all i think of is intimidation you know like like the people did not have per permission to protest and so that was a move to me that says stay back stay in your houses you know know your place you know don't be out on the streets protesting mm -hmm. um and i don't know either mm -hmm. but but it, i think it's um it's one of the things that is, it's hard to describe, obviously, because I'm not doing a great job describing it either, but, um, but when people only have that experience of police as helpful to them, um, it's hard to imagine that this right. could be true, right? But it is true right. for, for people who live a different kind of experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, it's totally, I mean, I grew up, so I grew up in Arlington, Massachusetts, which, um, which is a, a town right next to Cambridge, you know, it's between Lexington and Cambridge, Massachusetts. So it's right, right near Boston, largely, largely white town, um, you know, a little bit more working class than some of the other towns around it, which were wealthier, but like, you know, middle class white town, a suburb of Boston. And police were only ever nice to me, you know, police came on the bus and like taught on our school bus when we were growing up and like taught, taught us how to ask for help. And like, you know, it was, it was a very different experience. And, and even now, honestly, like, I think police are nicer to clergy than just to like regular people. A lot um, of people are nicer to clergy than in, regular people. At least in, the, in these settings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, we don't deserve no. it. No. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but as a white person, I think that, you know, usually I've never been directly harassed by police. And I think even in, I think part of why clergy presence is in settings like this diffuse kind of police aggression is because they often think that we're on their side, you know, we're on the side of, of peace, mm -hmm. um, which is true. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can say that. And I can also say that like, um, you know, peace isn't the absence of tension, like true peace is the presence of justice. I think I want to say Cornell West said that, although I might be getting that mm -hmm. wrong. Um, and so I'm showing up for that kind of piece, like the piece that includes the presence of justice, not not just an absence of tension, mm -hmm. which I think is often what the the kind of piece that that police are shooting for or sh shooting for with or expecting us to be on, on the side of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very um, my experience of police is totally different and than many of my neighbors. colleagues of color, uh, most of my neighbors of color. Yeah. And, and my ex-husband is African-American too. And, um, and like the number of times that, you know, we would get pulled over if he was driving and then they would like see me in the car with him and then would like, you know, be nicer, mm -hmm. um, versus like when he would come home after being pulled over for driving by himself while black, um, or like there was a time when there was something wrong with our car and we were parked outside of our house and he was like underneath the car trying to fix something and like a cruiser pulled up and like stopped him and um and asked him what he was doing and acted like he was trying to steal the car asked him where he lived and it was we were parked right outside of our house um and he had to like prove that he belonged there when Anytime I've been like, if I was lying outside of a car, the police stop and help me, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a very different experience being a white woman, um, in the world. And, and so part of, you know, part of what I see my call is, is like using the identity that I have to be, of, to be in support of the black people around me, black and brown people around me, um, who are having a drastically different experience with the police. Yeah. Abby, I can't believe it's 12.15, so we only have about 15 minutes left. This has gone fast. Time flies when you're talking about important things. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions yeah. have come in that I don't want to lose, and then I'll get back um, with whatever time we have left to a couple. I have a couple more questions, too. But um, relevant, especially to the incident you just talked about in West Philly that you witnessed, um, one of my congregants, Lisa, she says, has there been any communication or town halls between police and clergy since this horrible incident? And you said something about a commission that you were involved in as a clergy person, right? With the police. Yeah. So I'm, I'm one of, I think there's three clergy who are on that commission. Uh, um, but it's, it's like investigating the police. They haven't been, um, well, I shouldn't say they haven't been in touch with me. They, um, they showed up at my doorstep with a, um, with a piece of paper that basically just said like, give us a call related to an incident on 52nd street and the guy who showed up was like i think it's like an internal affairs something but that wasn't in the paperwork at all so like to be i feel like the police have tried to in intimidate me <laughs> since then but haven't like been in touch in other ways um yeah i mean there's you know there's some conversations like amongst our leaders our clergy leaders and city leadership there have been some conversations but um 
like with Commissioner Outlaw, who's the police commissioner, the new police commissioner here. Um, but I w there, there hasn't been any kind of significant level of accountability mm -hmm. um, or, or public dialogue or any, I haven't really seen any taking of responsibility other than, I suppose like the Commissioner Outlaw has sort of said like, I've seen videos and it deserves investigation, but, um, but internal investigations within police departments, at least in Philadelphia, um, almost never result in accountability. And so yeah. that's part of, part of what we're trying to do is create a police, a, a citizens accountability commission where there would be an actual check right. um, on the, on the police when stuff like this happens. That was a ballot question in Philadelphia this year, wasn't it? To create an independent commission. Yeah, yeah I remember that. And it passed, I think, right? And it passed. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's jarring as a resident of the city to watch the difference sometimes also between, between even within the police force. So sometimes the difference between what the police commissioner, Danielle Outlaw says, and what the police union chief says is just um, like oh, very, very, very far apart. And, yeah. and that is, telling about the fact that um you know that that, that uh i don't know what it's telling about it's telling <laughs> i guess that that um police are certainly not all on the same page about things which makes sense and um you can also see the range of opinions that are expressed and sometimes that is a little scary to me that um you know it's not a monolith of power um that there are other forms of power within the police force besides the kind of official one i guess is what i'm is what i'm saying when i get down to it so the union has a lot of power yeah. too there are and yeah they do and um and i also i mean you know usually i read what commissioner outlaw writes or or says um or i watch her speak and um and even when she first came i was like oh like this seems good like the kinds of things that she says feels like in alignment with you know what my hopes are um but ultimately she is the leader of the, the police department and the police department has done all kinds of egregious things under her leadership. And, um, and so, I mean, the, the way that she speaks publicly, like I, I am trusting that less than I did when she first came mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. There's another question um, that Susan, I think I'm going to wait until the very end because it's a little bit more broad about race in our country, but, um, but Abby, you know, we spent a lot of time kind of talking about what it was like being at the demonstrations and some of the things you experienced. I also want to make sure that we don't um, lay too heavily on talking about those experiences and also talk a little bit about kind of, you know, when when people who don't live in the city get coverage of what happens at these demonstrations, it's usually filtered through local news, mm -hmm. um, which can lead to kind of a flattening or a partial view of what's going on. Um, and again, kind of a erasure sometimes of the actual purpose and aims of why people are gathered. Um, as for you, as somebody who's been out there over the summer after George Floyd was murdered, more recently after Walter Wallace Jr. was murdered, when you're out there, how do you understand the, the purpose of the folks who are gathering out there in the streets? Yeah, I mean, the vast majority of, of people are, um, are grieving. I mean, vast, so like, Again, it's like 99% of the people who have been out on the streets um, are grieving and are um, and are angry and want something to change mm -hmm. and um, and don't know how to not necessarily don't know how to do that other than just like showing up with other people who are calling for that, but like that they just feel called to to be out there and use their bodies in, in witness to injustice yeah. um, and calling for something different. Um, and that, and that's an incredible thing. I mean, I think, you know, part of what has been happening be following like the, the policymaking, the city of Philadelphia, the commission that, that what went on the ballot and that passed and that is now um, being formed and will hopefully be formed with some sort of meaningful budget and some sort of meaningful, teeth and power, which is still a question. Right. Um, that was something that power, which is the interfaith justice coalition that I work with primarily, um, put out the call for in, I think like last December, there was a town hall about police accountability and um, they put out a call for a bunch of things to happen for the police to be more accountable. 
but there wasn't enough public will um, to make it happen until there was this mass movement in the streets. And so when people were out there day after day after day and the news was covering it every day and, um, and the nation's eyes were turned towards the need for racial justice, particularly um, police accountability, um, that was what enabled city council to actually say like, let's get this on the ballot. Um, and, and what enabled it to pass they, probably for a lot of people to pay attention and go, oh yeah, we do need that. Sorry, I yeah, interrupted you. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, totally, totally. And so like these, these mass movements, like they, they do make a difference because like the attention that they draw when a lot of people show up on the streets and say, this is wrong, we need to do something differently. Um, it forces politicians to make change. And I have not seen, I have not seen city government move so quickly to do something different um, ever <laughs> in my life, the way that they did that week in um, uh, the week that Philadelphia was sort of became part of the uprising after George Floyd's mur murder. Yeah. Um, you know, there's also obviously always a small number of people who use any situation um, opportunistically. Um, so like an Eagles football Lodge, win, for example, Flyers game. I sort of realized it's because I'm a musical theater nerd or was in my younger age, as I know you might share some of mm. that identity, at least at one point in your life. I realized that like at some point over the summer that the, the, a lot of the media coverage was basically covering um, like the Tenardiers from Les Mis, <laughs> like, you know, like the, the innkeeper and his wife who, who dress up like one kind of soldier, then they dress up like another, and then they're just trying to steal from everybody. Yeah. They're um, taking advantage and of the chaos. Taking, yeah, they're taking advantage of this justice movement um, in order to stuff, you know, line their own pockets. And they'll say whatever they can, they'll try to incite whoever they can to, to make their own pockets, you know, fuller. Right. There's a handful of people like that always, right? And the news coverage of those people is like, <laughs> You know, they get 10 times the news coverage of um, of the vast majority. So that like 1% gets a huge amount of coverage because they've, you know, they've broken a window and stolen a pair of shoes from Foot Locker or whatever. Um, but the but the other 99% of people are showing up in um, in call for a more just um, a more just community. Yeah. That, that goes back to, to just one last thing I wanted to check in with you about because um, we've talked a lot about what it was like for you to be there. Do you think there's any other important misconceptions or anything that you want to clear up or something that you want to make sure people know about what, um, what has been happening in Philadelphia this year? Um, if we covered them all, we might've covered them all too. But. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just say that there, uh, just say again, that there's not, there's not one perspective that is held by people on the streets, not even just like, the 99% of, of protesters calling for justice and the 1%, you know, Tenardiers. seeking personal gain, yeah. Yeah, the Tenardiers. Um, but you know, the night that the afternoon that Walter Wallace was killed, um, I was asked to join other clergy on, on his block. And, um, and so about, I think about two hours after his murder, um, I was on his block and just talking to his neighbors and, um, you know, and they were telling me about him and telling me about the ways that he, um, you know, was friendly to them and the way that he would carry his baby daughter around the neighborhood. And, um, and we prayed with his mom and his dad and, um, you know, the, what, what people needed on the block that night was, um, was to cope with trauma um, that comes from this kind of murder. But like, it was the third murder on their street this year. It wasn't like, it was the first police murder, but like, you know, gun violence in this, this level of trauma is so huge. And, and, you know, when you look at Philadelphia is like the poorest big, big city or the, 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 um, the city with the highest level of deep poverty of any big city in the United States. Um, and when you look at 
when you really spend time looking at pictures of like looting, like there are people who are, who are walking out of looted stores with like boxes of diapers, you know? I mean, like you don't, I, I have never been so, um, so poor that I would take advantage of a broken open store so that I, so that my kid would have diapers, you know, and like to disconnect, to disconnect the story of what's happening right now from poverty and to disconnect it from, um, from a long history of racism is just, is just not knowing the fullness of the story. Um, and, and to cast judgment on people who are like looting, um, when, without understanding what that poverty looks like here is, um, I think is unfair. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the root causes of this injustice is like, it's that there needs to be more police accountability, but there also needs to be better education. There needs to be more jobs. There needs to be fairer housing policies. Um, there needs to be a higher minimum wage. And so, um, to me, like all of those fights are really intertwined and, um, and also for people who feel particularly like because they don't live in the middle of where this is happening or because they, um, or because their COVID risk tolerance is lower, um, but they're working for a better education system or they're working for, um, economic justice through, you know, calling for a higher minimum wage or whatever, like this, these, this is part of the movement too. And all of the, all of the parts of the movement are really important. Um, and so I hope people hear that too. I, I think that there's, um, there's a lot of focus on like the movement on the streets and that's, and it's part of the story, but it by no means is it the full story. And we need, we all need to be involved in this fight in, um, in whatever ways we can, whatever spheres of influence we have, we need to take advantage of for a, a more just world. Yeah. I often say there's so many roles, there's so many hands that are needed in all kinds of different work and all kinds of different places to untangle the messes that we have inherited. Um, And I also like, um, uh, it it fits with what I was going to ask you as our last question, um, you know, to to come back to compassion and, and our values as Unitarian Universalists when we think about how you use can be in relationship with justice movements. Um, you know, and how we hope that our faith guides us to be in relationship with the justice movements that we see, um, that one part of that is, one part of that is remembering um, the call of our faith, not to ever dehumanize people, not to ever reduce people to a single story, but to think more deeply about, like you said, why is someone stealing a package of diapers? You know, like, let's, let's remember that these stories are whole human stories. They're bigger than, than just one, um, one experience or one moment in someone's life that we're being presented a tiny slice of. Um, I think that's a big part of how our faith leads us to be connected with justice movements. Um, I don't, I, do you have anything else in terms of when you, when you hope, when you look ahead to your hopes for how UUism can be in relationship with justice movements? Um, is there something concrete that you hope for from our faith communities or more abstract? <laughs> concrete or abstract. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I agree with you that I think our faith calls us to, um, not just hope for a more just world, but, but take action for a more just world. I don't think that we can just believe in justice. I think that actually each one of us needs to be participating in making that world happen. Um, and I don't think it's okay to not participate. I mean, I, I think that there's a million ways that we can participate. And so it, there's not like an excuse for like, oh, I, you know, I, even just voting, I feel like I hope that everyone votes and it's not enough, you know? Um, so whether that means like working with your kids um, school board around like, what are the free lunch policies where you live? Or like, what are the, um, like, what kind of, Um, people get elected to, to school board leadership in your town. Um, Is it representative of the community? Yeah. Is it representative of the community and like, or working for mental health um, purposes? Like I I think all of us, um, all of us have some connection to some issue that feels really important 
to to us and um and all of us have some kind of sphere of influence where we can make a difference whether it's being able to go out on the streets or whether it's um, um, paying attention to how you spend your money. Um, like there's, there's all kinds of ways that we can use our, use our power for, um, for good in the world. And so um, I would hope that we do better at, uh, as a faith at taking action for justice, not just being on the right side of things, but actually showing up on the right side of things in whatever form that looks like. Um, and I would say more, more specifically, a way that we're not always great is, um, is following the leadership of the people who are most affected by the injustice. So if that's racism, following the leadership of people of color, if that's classism, following the leadership of, of poor people, um, and us um, not thinking that like we have to reinvent the wheel and not thinking that we need to be in charge and, and not doing only the glamorous stuff too, like the stuff that um, where we're the ones speaking at the march or whatever, but like showing up and sometimes that means like sometimes that means shutting up, you know, or like being at the back or um, being a follower or organizing being a follower. Yeah. Um, and but it also means being in deep relationships with with people who are um, who are most affected by the injustices we're trying to fight. And so I think deepening our relationships um, across privilege and oppression, um, finding the humility to follow, follow those leaders, um, and just making sure that we're, we're taking action in whatever way makes sense in our lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Abby, for taking a whole hour out of your day. I know that it is busy to talk to us. It's really helpful. Um, yeah. and fun to talk to you. Well, always a pleasure. And I miss you. I know I miss you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. uh, do you have a couple minutes to answer one more question that came in early on, or we can also answer it in the comments afterwards. Sure. Um, another one of my congregants yes, no, very fine. early when we started, um, and it, it kind of touches back on what you were just saying about looking for the many ways to be part of justice and thinking about justice, not just out in demonstrations, but in our daily lives. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought of it again as, as we were closing out. Um, one of my congregants says, many people I now know, many people I know now live in retirement communities. And this, this question has actually come up before, Susan, with someone else at Wellsprings. How do, I, how do you ask if the community is diverse? And I'm, I'm wondering what other questions are behind that, right? Like, if you're, if you're thinking about asking your friends who live in retirement communities if their community is diverse, you know, that, that question of diversity often is kind of a top layer, I think, for other questions beneath it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which is, something that I think is being teased out a lot by these recent social movements that, you know, we spent a lot of the 90s and the early 2000s talking about diversity, but it always begs the question, well, why isn't a place diverse if it's not diverse, right? What is the deeper justice issue that is keeping people separated or segregated? Um, so I don't know, Abby, I, I'm, I'm talking in part to give you time to think about how to answer that question. <laughs> but um, Susan, I would also say, yeah. you know, if you're thinking about how to ask if a community is diverse, to a friend, um, maybe think a little bit more about why you're asking, because you can always just say, hey, how diverse is the community you've moved into? But the person's next question yeah. is probably gonna be, why are you asking, you know? Um, or, you know, is there an assumption that, div that not diverse means something that can lead to a deeper conversation between the two of you, if you've done the, the thinking on your own to say, you know, well, I'm asking because um, I'm thinking about these issues more now that I see what's on the news or I've been reading a lot or hearing a lot at my church about, you know, the policies that are in place that have kept people separated and I'm trying to learn more about what I can do to change that, you know, so if, if you um, do, a, you know, I think you can just ask the question of someone, um, but be prepared that that was probably going to open a deeper conversation and kind of where do you want to take that conversation, I guess is what I would say. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I hope that was helpful, yeah, Susan. And, Abby, your um, thoughts? <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm curious too, Susan, from a little bit more about what you're um, what you're thinking about. I mean, I th I think that there's um, I, I would ag agree with Lee that there's there's sort of diversity. So like, what's what's the makeup of the community? Um, and often there's a lot of hidden diversity mm -hmm. too, right? Like people who um, who are um, Latinx who look you know, look white or people who are mixed race who look white or, um, 
or whatever, whatever kinds of diversity get hidden in uh, when you do a quick glance through what's going on, but but that those stories are real and that that is, those experiences are part of are part of communities that it, that tend to be hidden. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say also like you're looking at diversity, but you're also looking at power dynamics. So I would say a lot of retirement communities, if it's a if it's a nicer um, Okay, how about real estate people? Can you ask? Oh, I see. So like if you're if you're trying to make a decision about whether to go into a retirement community, is that what you're thinking, Susan? <laughs> Wait for Susan. It takes a time. while. It's a little uh, bit of a delay. Yeah, I mean, I think I think particularly I don't know Susan's identities, but I know like as a white person, I was taught that like I wasn't supposed to see color and so I wasn't supposed to talk about it. And so like even finding ways to have conversations about racial diversity, for example, I, I wasn't given the tools for how to do that when I was younger. But like, it's really okay to be like, how, how racially diverse is the community? I'm interested in living in a diverse community. Right. Um, but, but also like, or like I'm interested in living in a community that like has good policies around like queer families. And I want like to have queer elders who get to yeah. live in the community with me and not just an assumption that everyone is is straight. Yeah. It's, it's um, part of my value system. So also... I'm, I'm interested in living in a place that aligns yeah. with my values in all kinds of different ways. And if a diverse community is one of those values, yeah, yeah. it's okay. It's not, if you're, if you're genuine, you yeah. know, it's not illegal. It's not that, like yeah. employing someone and asking about their background. You know, you can ask, you know, when you're talking to real estate people, you can ask about the communities that you're planning to move into and, and find that out. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and I think like you're, I would say that like in making those decisions, because, because it's possible that like a lot of the communities won't have a ton of diversity depending on where you're looking, because a lot of that, you know, makes a difference in terms of location and there might be a location that's right for you for other reasons. Um, but you can also like see like what the values of the community are. I would say that like a lot of times retirement communities might have largely white population, largely white leadership, and a lot of people of color who serve in like uh, lower, you know, lower level jobs in those communities. Um, and like, you can find out a little bit more about what, what the employment policies are like, and like whether people are paid well and treated well, and whether there's opportunities for advancement for people of color um, who work there, for example. Mm -hmm. We live now in a, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think go for it. Ask the question, Susan. I, I think that um, particularly like the more that the more we talk about this stuff openly and say like being in a diverse community matters to me, that's the kind of place that I would like to, you know, age in place. Like the more that particularly the more that white people are saying that, the more that places will feel like it's okay to like to to start considering that as an important value as they're creating policies and trying to create communities like the more that that we um, contribute to feeling like it's not something we can talk about um, the harder it's going to be for places to change yeah. the, the more we the more we're basically saying the status quo is okay with us and if the status quo yeah. isn't actually inclusive then that's not okay with us so we yeah talking about yeah. it is always a good first step yeah yeah speak about your values yeah ask for the things that matter to you that's a good you you thing All too we tend not to be quiet. Yeah. We tend to speak up. <laughs> we, we do. And it's hard. I mean, there's lots of areas where it's like, I don't know what to say, or I don't know how to say that. But, um, yeah. but taking that, taking the risk and taking the, um, taking the bull by the horns to just like say it is, is, an, is a powerful thing. Yeah. Well, all right. I've kept you an extra 10 minutes now, Abby. So I'm going to let okay. you get back to your day. Um, thank you for your witness. Um, and for sharing the fruits of that witness with all of us. And um, I have always been thinking all year as people write in or message in to me because I live in the city and they're asking me if I'm okay. I just remind mm -hmm. people I'm fine. You know, please pray for the people who are out on the streets, make sure that they are safe, make sure that the people who are out there um, with the mission and the job to keep them safe are doing that job well. Um, that's what we want for everyone. So I, um, I don't know. I love you, friend. You, you do, you do good ministry and, um, love you, friend. You do too. Thanks. And, and I pray that you stay safe for any times that you're out on the street. I did order a clergy collar shirt for the first time. I didn't, I didn't have one. 
did? Yeah. And yeah. I think it came in the mail yesterday. I still have to go open my package that's sitting downstairs. So <laughs> <That's exciting. laughs> maybe I'll see you out there someday soon. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, I hope I'm, we don't have to though. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, like I was I, in the, when the movement, when the like uprising started happening in Philly over the summer, I was not pregnant. Mm -hmm. I now am pregnant and, um, and tear gas is a dangerous thing to someone who's pregnant. So my risk tolerance has had to go down, yeah. um, at this time too, but, um, but there's lots of, there's lots of good work to be done. And by the way, I think that power, I, I know that power, uh, the interfaith justice coalition that we work with is expanding to have more of a statewide presence. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if they're out in, you guys are in Chester County, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if they're out quite where you are yet, but if you guys are interested in, in connecting in a, um, with an interfaith group, that's not just, not just for interfaith dialogue, but actually like a group of interfaith people moving towards a common, uh, justice purpose. I think power might be there already or might be coming there yeah. sometime soon. So um, I would be happy to talk with you all if that's ever a direction that your congregation wants to go. Thanks. In. Yeah, I know our Justice Works team has had at least one meeting with a power rep, but I think it may have been a preliminary conversation because they were not quite yet organizing in Chester County. But we do have other organizations that I have learned more about this year. There's a Chester County Stands Up um, branch that's very active, that was very active in organizing demonstrations over the summer. Um, we are part of an interfaith group that is more for relationship and dialogue, but there are some outgrowths of that now. Yeah, we do that too. Yeah, yeah. There, there's now some outgrowths of that that I've heard about that are trying to get organized, especially around immigration issues, because um, there's a huge population of Latinx farm workers in Chester County, and that um, population often faces risks from ICE and deportation and all kinds of other issues. So there's there's plenty of Right. There's plenty of justice work to be done in Chester County. It's not all horse farms, so. <laughs> yep, it's everywhere. Yep. <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, it's how big everywhere. is the baby today? Yep. What size baby animal are you? Is the little baby in your belly? The, this is probably going to be your favorite one so far, Lee. So I'm 21 weeks this today. Mm -hmm. It is the size of a Maltese puppy. Oh! <laughs> which is your favorite. <laughs> Can you just have the Maltese puppy and give oh. it to me and then have the baby later? No, that's not how it works. It's not actually I, a Maltese I, puppy in your belly. I think that you should get a Maltese puppy mm -hmm. and then I can feel it and be like, this is how big my baby is. And um, that would be really cool. Did I tell you I'm getting a hamster? <laughs> I'm going to get a hamster for the winter. You did. I did tell you. I know. Yeah. I've, I've been considering sending you lots of pictures and videos, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. But that's every time cool. I see one, I now think... Lee's going to have one. Of these. I know. I ordered the cage, so it's really happening now. I just have to go get the little animal once the cage gets here. Woo! All right. Oh, my gosh. Are you just going to get one, or are you going to get a little fan? Hamsters don't like company, apparently. Like, they don't like, they fight when they're with mm. each other in a cage. So you get, you get one hamster. It's different for different small rodents. Some gerbils really want company or guinea pigs or something, but hamsters like to be solitary. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Good to know. I will bow to the hamster's wishes. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot wait to meet your hamster. I, I can't wait to meet your baby. A little more excited than the hamster. <laughs> I'm excited about both. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a great day, Abby. Thanks all again. Right. Thanks, everybody's watching. Too. Good to see Bye, you. Bye, all. Bye, everybody.